I'm Kevin Ryan. I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, and I'm going to talk about the salmon aquaculture industry and its impact on uh, freshwater rivers and lakes in Chile. I'm going to try to remember my facts because my brain is like full of all the fascinating information that I've learned um, so far this morning. Um, but we've seen some vertical north-south pictures of Chile, and this is Chile on its side, so that I can show you this bar graph of the um, sides of the rivers coming off the country. And so Chile is mostly mountains and coastlines, so from a water resources perspective, this is a very interesting country. Um, most of that water is in the southern part of the country. Um, and that's what this is kind of showing. Um, I've marked the Los Rios and Los Lagos regions named after the water that's there. Um, and that's where I'm going to be in Valdivia at the University of Australia. I'm going to be working with uh, Dr. Stefan Wolfel and Jorge Nemps. They are directors of a limnology lab. Limnology is a science word for the study of freshwater ecosystems. So they study um, all kinds of things in their region, from new species um, of um, algae or crustaceans in the lakes to the impacts on those rivers and lakes. And so they've been uh, following this issue of the salmon um, aquaculture industry for a while now. Um, and the university itself, I just wanted to show a picture, is like on an island surrounded by water. Um, there's uh, uh, wetlands and, and rivers. You kind of have to cross bridges um, uh, when they're not blocked to get there. And then the region um, sort of inland from the university is just um, full of glacier uh, lakes and, uh, and rivers. So. This is also a really good place um, to do uh, industry that requires lots of water, which is why um, the salmon aquaculture industry is there. Um, so there's an increase in global demand for fish because it's a high quality meat. Um, uh, there's uh, chili, I think, it's my understanding that salmon is Chile's number two export behind copper, so it's a big business in Chile. Um, and over the past, um, you know, half a century, the global um, amount of, of aquaculture has increased to meet the global demand of fish um, because we can't get more fish out of the oceans, essentially. And so if we want to keep producing fish for the market, it has to be artificially cultivated. Um, and that's why this industry has, uh, has uh, uh, demand. Um, other places in the world where they farm salmon are um, places with similar geography. Uh, so Norway, British Columbia, uh, New Zealand, uh, the UK, um, and I think Chile is um, number two behind Norway in the global production. Um, so not only is it big for Chile, but it's also important for the global market. Um, and uh, then the other thing I wanted to point out is that this is just uh, the tons of uh, salmon produced um, since 1997, and you can see that it's increasing um, with global demand, but it's also been increasing rapidly over the past uh, two to three decades. And this increase in production has really outpaced the environmental regulation or community response um, to control any pollution from that activity. Um, so just to give you um, some information or a reminder about the life cycle of uh, salmon, it's an adromous fish which has two uh, phases in its life cycle. Um, it's a freshwater uh, phase when they're um, hatched in eggs. And so the, and then they spend about a year in rivers naturally, um, and then they'll spend one, two, or more years uh, growing as an adult in the ocean until sexual maturity. And so as an industry, you have to replicate that process in order to cultivate the fish. And so they do that um, on the side of lakes and rivers in tanks. Um, uh, and for the freshwater phase, and this is a, a picture or a, a map of the southern part of the um, country just showing you kind of the relative extent of where these facilities are, and it's not focused on one particular uh, river or lake, it's kind of everywhere. And so if you guys go out, take a visit for hiking or camping in the south, you may come across a facility, and that's probably what's happening, um, is that they're growing fish inside these tanks. So. And then when they, then they'll truck them, they'll put them into a truck and drive them to the coast. Um, and they'll put them in these sort of massive hanging or floating cages so that they can uh, continue growing them. And this is a, a blow up map of the Chile Way, sort of southern fjords, uh, Patagonia region. 
and show these black dots also showing the extent um, uh, of these operations, and they're kind of everywhere. Um, so if you do travel down there as well, you'll probably see these. Um, I'll just mention that it's really, um, this is uh, protected from the open ocean, so it's highly valued coastline to do this type of uh, activity. Um, yeah, so that's how you, and I'll just give you an example of a land-based facility. Um, I'm only going to focus on the freshwater um, in my project, so I won't be at the coast, but uh, this is a river that's running sort of from the, this side from up to down. And so essentially what they do is they just take water out of the river um, by gravity and then flow it through the tanks um, and then uh, that's where the fish are living and then the, the water then kind of goes through this settling pond uh, to allow any of the solids to settle out so they don't go back to the river. It might go through a rotating drum filter to remove part particulates, but there's no other additional chemical treatment for any of the waste that comes from these facilities. Um, and then it just, it literally just runs right back into the river and there's this mixing process that occurs. Um, so that's just kind of an example. Um, this is a really efficient way to grow, to cultivate fish because you always have clean, uh, fresh water. Um, so there's a reason why the industry is successful here, um, but it does have an impact. So. so some of those impacts are literally just the solid waste, feces, the, the uneaten food, um, and the dissolved molecules is more like what I'm uh, interested in in, in, in my PhD, um, but these are essentially just nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus and, and organics. Sometimes there's uh, antibiotics added to keep the fish healthy. Um, there's pesticides added to, to keep the fish healthy as well from parasites, um, and there's also a salt added sometimes to help in the smultification process as the freshwater uh, life cycle is transitioning to the salt, uh, to the to the uh, marine phase. Um, this is just a really nasty picture of like some dirty. Um, <laughs> we call it effluent. It's a literally industrial wastewater, um, even though they're they're uh, just growing fish. Um, but often downstream, we see the temperature of the of the river increase because there's a biological activity of the fish themselves. Um, and the conductivity is a really simple uh, water quality metric that shows that there's more dissolved components um, than upstream. So all of this new nutrients promotes the growth of bacteria and fungi, um, and then when they eventually run into the, the, these nice pristine lakes, um, they can um, contribute to eutrophication, which is another big science word that just means increasing nutrient levels. Um, and so with all those nutrients in the lake and all the light, um, we get algae blooms. And some of those algae blooms, this is kind of this green color here, um, can be toxic and harmful to humans. Um, and so this actually hits Chile in another economic activity, um, tourism, especially in the summertime when people want to uh, swim in these lakes. And so we have kind of have conflicting um, uh, industries there. It also brings a lot of uh, attention to the, to the issue. Um, and I'm going to explain in the next slide, but um, this issue of eutrophication in these, um, these lakes is, is not only due to the aquaculture industry. There's lots of other uh, activities in these watersheds. Um, so. so one example um, is the Lago Villarica watershed. Um, this is in Pucón, Villarica, if you're, it's like the adventure ecotourism capital of Chile or South America or something like that. There's lots of uh, things to do there and it brings lots of people, um, including people from uh, you know, Chileans um, like to have mountain homes there. Um, and so this is the watershed. It goes up to the Continental Divide and, and drains down into this uh, Lago Villarica. And I have a news story here right when the proposal was coming out. They officially declared this lake to have exceeded its water quality limits for nutrients. So that triggered uh, a response from the government that said, okay, now we need to get, monitor this further and create a plan for decontaminating this um, uh, watershed. And so they, they sort of have done that since um, over the past couple of years. And I made this timeline more for myself than to explain to you guys, but it shows you kind of the history of what's happened in this, in this particular watershed over the past 20 years or so. 
Um, but there's lots of agriculture, deforestation, erosion, uh, septic tanks that may not be functioning, uh, uh, and uh, hot springs even. And so all of these cumulative sources impact the, um, the, the lake. And so that's kind of what the management plan is supposed to do is decide, well, how do we uh, fix all of these problems um, at once? Because they all come to uh, the same lake. And so right now they're going through a stakeholder, uh, manage, stakeholder meeting process to try to develop uh, solutions. And that's going to occur over the next, uh, I guess, couple of years. And then the, the implementation of that plan could occur over the next five to seven years. And so the aim of my project is to try to generate some data um, early on while I'm here that could help inform some of these decisions that are going to be made for this watershed. So the, the first question. Um, uh, just kind of goes off of this uh, report that came out last year. Um, it's a 200 page report um, that's based off of six sampling days. Um, so there's, and they, you know, that's a problem for them and they, they acknowledge that. And so really any new data is helpful. Um, but uh, you can see they've drawn uh, solid lines in between uh, these points over the period of a year and a half, you know. Um, and so we know that uh, the production cycle of salmon and even seasons and uh, water cycles cause changes in chemistry continuously. And so one of the goals of my research will be to try to use some sensors, uh, which I have experience with, um, to try to capture some more daily uh, diurnal signals or weekly or um, other things associated with uh, the feeding of the salmon um, or uh, harvesting or cleaning the facilities. So then the uh, second question is also related uh, sort of in response to the most recent report, uh, which would be uh, when they did a modeling exercise which assumed that every pollution source uh, went through the catchment and arrived at the, at the lake. Um, and we know that that's not actually what happens because all of these uh, nutrients and waste immediately become uh, cycled, uh, respired by uh, bacteria, used up in the stream bed, and that situation can changes from upstream to downstream towards the lake. So um, uh, Jorge Nemsch, uh, uh, um, my affiliate, has done some studies looking at 100, 200 to 2 kilometers downstream of these facilities and looking at how the chemistry is changing. And so we're, we hope to do some of those uh, studies as well. Um, and then lastly, um, I just wanted to say that I also have a, a, teaching, a teaching and cultural exchange aspect proposed um, to um, guest lecture and participate in some field um, and lab uh, work for their environmental science classes that they have at the university. There. It's a very, it's a, it's a university with a, a large focus on environmental science. You get a lot of um, uh, good students there. And then there's the American Corner. I think somebody mentioned that uh, this morning. I can't remember. Uh, but this is a, a space in the library where you can show up as an American and talk to people. Uh, you can give a lecture, or you can coordinate an event, um, and so that's going to be really useful for just um, sharing American culture. So, uh, yeah, that's what I had to. Say.